There is a special magic to the Magic Kingdom, a special energy, a special franticness, a special busyness, and who can blame this place for being the busiest, craziest, wildest park of them all? After all, it's the most kingdomy, the most walty, well, the most magical. That's why it's called the Magic Kingdom. Hello, everybody. It's a sometimes vlog. It's a vlog that happens sometimes, and sometimes it happens at Walt Disney World, where it happens to be my last day out here of this trip. We filmed the Contemporary Resort. We filmed the Grand Floridian. Did all kinds of hotels, actually. We got uh, a little surprise, a suite at the Beach Club Resort, which is over by Epcot, if you've never heard of it. And I don't blame you if you've never heard of it, unless you're kind of a crazed Walt Disney World enthusiast or have just happened to stay there. Uh, not many people have heard of it, and that's okay. Not everybody has to know everything to enjoy, about something to enjoy something. That's always been my philosophy. People always think of me as somewhat of a Disney expert. I don't try to be a Disney expert in any way. I'm just an enthusiast, and I love sharing what I'm enthusiastic about with all of my friends. Anyways, Magic Kingdom may be the most magical park. It's also the most difficult park to get into if you're just going into the regular parking, even with an annual pass and everything, and you go to park your car, you are gonna spend some time getting on the monorail, or uh, like we showed in the whole video about the monorail the other day on the other sometimes vlog, or, you know, hopping on board the ferry boat. Takes a while to get in, then you gotta get through the whole ticketing area, then you gotta come through the gates, and you gotta come down Main Street USA, and finally to the hub, and finally, finally, into some lands. It's kind of worth it in a way because the presentation is like 10 out of 10. When they built this place, they were planning on that grand adventure. It takes an adventure just to get into the park. So by the time you're in the park, you are already on your adventure. Unlike say pulling up and just walking in the front gate of somewhere and then having to begin it. By the time you get to Main Street USA, <laughs> you've been on an adventure for quite a while. The uh, outside world falls off in stages. I believe, I hope, that was the idea behind the whole thing. And then suddenly, finally, once you're into one of the lands and about to go on one of the attractions, you are ready, you are primed, you are just itching for some action. Anyway, it is my last day at Walt Disney World and I came over here to uh, snoop at something uh, over in Frontierland and it is something from yeah, Disneyland. Now. They built the Magic Kingdom in 1971. That's when this place opened. Obviously, they started construction a little bit before that. Disneyland, of course, was open since 1955. So the one in California is the original park. And that means when they built Magic Kingdom, uh, they were building it all based off the version in Anaheim. But here's the thing. The one in Anaheim, California, had been changing and changing since the beginning, since the early 1950s, or well, the mid 1950s when it opened, right in the middle of the 1950s. Why would I say the early 1950s? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Anyways, since the beginning, Anaheim had been changing. They'd been taking out attractions. They had been adding new attractions. So much had happened. So much had changed. And as they were building Magic Kingdom, there were certain things they had left over that they either removed from the other park or had changed in the other park that they were able to bring here to the Magic Kingdom. And the most famous of these, obviously, the most well-known would be the Carousel of Progress, which has actually moved twice because it was originally built for the 1964 World's Fair for the GE Pavilion. Walt Disney sort of directed that show himself. My friend Bob Gurr actually invented, or well, built. The Walt came up with the idea and then Bob Gurr built the dog in that show? You know how there's a little dog that sits right by the father throughout all the various scenes? That was Walt's idea. What if we had a little dog that was answering back, barking back to the thing? And my friend Bob Gurr built that dog. It's kind of crazy. So for the 1964 World's Fair, it then later went to Disneyland upstairs in what later became America Sings and the Interventions Building and was the uh, most recently the Star Wars Launch Bay and all that kind of stuff. And then it was moved uh, to the Magic Kingdom. So that's the most famous example. That's the example people always bring up when they say, you know, there are attractions in the Magic Kingdom that come straight from Disneyland. Obviously they have a, their own pirates here, their own Big Thunder, but those were built here from scratch. That show is literally from old Disneyland and literally from the World's Fair. Of course, the parts and pieces have been changed many times. It's been refurbished many times, upgraded many times. So it's not literally the same show you would see in 1964, but you know, more or less, for all practical intents and purposes, you are seeing a show that used to play at Disneyland on a regular basis. Now there's another one that Disneyland people, um, seeing as how when you're born and raised in California or you grew up with Disneyland as sort of your home park kind of thing, we always kind of consider, oh, you know, Magic Kingdom, that's the, uh, 
that's not the imposter, but you know, the one that comes second. You always assume like, oh, the second Tiki Room. Ah, the second Big Thunder. Ah, the second this, the second. We had the originals. We had the best out in California. And so a lot of Californians assume that we also had the Country Bear Jamboree in Anaheim first, but no, this Country Bear Jamboree was the original. It opened on opening day, 1971, out here at the Magic Kingdom, October 1st, 1971. Did it open on opening year or did it open slightly after? Either way, it was an opening year attraction over here and it was so popular at the Magic Kingdom, they then opened a version in Anaheim. I believe it's the same case with um, Space Mountain and things like that. But it's not just the Carousel of Progress. There are many other little things out here. Everything from the pieces of animatronics when they built this place, like little parts and pieces, um, to you know the trash can designs. So much was taken, obviously, from what they learned in Anaheim. But I always walk around here and wonder, was there anything else that was literally taken from Anaheim? Were there any other props and parts and pieces? Was it all scratch built? Was it all built from scratch for the new Florida project for the Magic Kingdom? Or did they bring things from home? So I'm always on the lookout for either things that were here in 1971 and maybe have been removed that came from Disneyland or better yet, things in Magic Kingdom from the original Disneyland that are still here and that you can still see today. And over on the shores of the Rivers of America, we have an example of something that did come from Disneyland and is still on display at the Magic Kingdom, although not in quite as crazy of a shape as it used to be. I don't want to bury the lead. I don't want to keep building up to it. Let's go straight over there. Now, when they built the Magic Kingdom back in the 1970s, there obviously was no Splash Mountain. That didn't even open at Disneyland, which had the original, in 1989. There was actually no Big Thunder Mountain. That also opened later. Believe it or not, that didn't open up out here until 1980, which is a surprise even to me. Every time I hear that again, I'm like, 1980? What were they doing without Big Thunder for all that time? Seven, no, nine years without any Big Thunder. So as you can imagine, uh, for most of the 70s, this whole area had really nothing in it except for, not this Frontierland train station, but a Frontier uh, Land train station and a big grassy uh, stretch of ground. And because you're on the edge of the frontier, because you're on the edge of the rivers of America, there were a whole bunch of random totem poles. And those totem poles were not built for the Magic Kingdom. They were built for Disneyland. Now today, obviously, we do have Splash Mountain or what's about to become Tiana's Bayou Adventure. We do have the new train station down there. Actually, we should look at the front of Tiana's before we go, but we'll get to that in a second. We do have Big Thunder Mountain. We do have this whole riverscape over here with the entrance to Tom Sawyer Island. And so, as you can see, there are no totem poles around me except that back here beyond Big Thunder and a place that you almost never see unless you're actually exiting from Big Thunder and just happen to wander down to the riverside or if you used to be a smoker at the Magic Kingdom and used to use this old smoking area which is still here but has a bunch of signs that say no smoking on them now you might have never seen this but down here like I said there's the Big Thunder exit down this path, right against the rivers of America, visible from the bridge on Tom Sawyer Island. Look at this. You have not one, not two, but three totem poles here that used to be part of a fleet of totem poles all through this blank, empty, grassy area here at Magic Kingdom that, you guessed it, were originally from Disneyland. Now, I've done whole videos on this. I've shown old footage. I've shown old photos of the Disneyland Indian Village. That's not my name for it. That's what it was called, where they had uh, all kinds of different Native American crafts, Native American dances. You could meet uh, people from various tribes who would kind of be cultural ambassadors. They would talk about their history and their heritage, uh, people from various tribes and nations and that kind of thing at Disneyland, which by the 1970s, by the American Indian movement and all that kind of stuff, was starting to feel, I mean, at least even though it was this great experiment, and all the people who worked there really enjoyed it and they had all kinds of input from the tribes and for, 19, for the 1950s when it started in its very earliest form, uh, up through the 1970s, sort of in its heyday, um, they had all kinds of input from all kinds of different Native American peoples. It was very progressive for its time, but by the middle of the 1970s, like I said, American Indian movement, all that kind of stuff, just on paper, the idea of like, oh, we're gonna put Native American stuff in a theme park for people to stare at, 
it was just a bad look. It was just a little bit dated. And so the Indian village, as it was called at Disneyland, went the way of the buffalo, as it were, and was taken out in favor of building Critter Country. Ironically, it's the success of the Magic Kingdom, more than any kind of cultural sensitivity, that led to uh, the Indian village's downfall because they built the Country Bear Jamboree over there. That's why I mentioned it. We're bringing it all full circle. See what I'm doing? They built the Country Bear Jamboree over there. It was so popular. They wanted to put it at Disneyland, and they changed the Indian village area into, well, back then, Bear Country. Today is Critter Country, so that they could put in, have a little land, to put in the Country Bear Jamboree. Now, when they, now obviously they were gearing up for the eventual 1980 opening of Bing Thunder Mountain. They were going to change this whole landscape here. Look, they're doing photo pass pictures over here, so we're just checking it out in between. And so, in 1975, uh, as they are preparing to open uh, Country Bear J Jamboree, oh, man, there's so many names flying through my head right now. As they were preparing to open Country Bears in Anaheim, they were removing all the stuff from the Indian village and they had tons and tons of these totem poles that literally littered the landscape over there. And so they brought them all here to the Magic Kingdom, put them along the grass here until all of this stuff was built. And these three are the last three remaining. Now they're likely to be the real ones. I can even see at the base multiple layers of concrete and places where maybe they've been rotted out or damaged at the bottom by the groundwater. And so they've changed them. I don't know if they were ever made of wood. They may have been made out of, um, fiberglass, just like the Tiki's and the Tiki Room Lanai and stuff like that. Actually, most of Main Street USA is built out of fiberglass because wood will eventually rot from being pressure washed and rained on and all that kind of stuff. And so these are probably fiberglass originals. They may be fiberglass copies. Sometimes Disney does make big molds of these types of things and copy them. But since they've whittled it down to three, I'm assuming these are just three originals they have left. And I have sat here many, many times over the years, scrolling through uh, the pictures that I have of the Indian Village. And I have a pretty good collection of the old Disneyland Indi uh, Indian Village photos. They're a pretty good collection. I've done some videos. I have a lot of old footage of different stuff, uh, as you saw in the whole history video. And if you haven't seen that, go back and it's very visual. It's less of my face and a lot more <laughs> seeing what, what the park actually looked like back in the day. But I have sat here and figured out that yes, indeed, these are Disneyland original totem poles. Now scrolling through uh, most of the pictures online that you can find, my pictures didn't have a lot of the totem pole photos. They're not pictures of all of them. There were so many at Disneyland, but a quick look through some of the Dave Land photos and some other photos online. You will actually see this specific totem pole right here in the front. You will also see this middle totem pole. I haven't yet found an exact match for this one. Obviously, sometimes the coloring of them, because they've been repainted many times, will change things. Oh, you hear that? That's your steamboat coming. But I have confirmed visually that these two totem poles come straight from Disneyland themselves. And so that's awesome. There is still a little piece of the original Disneyland on display here, other than the Carousel of Progress. These props came straight from the Indian Village of Disneyland, our frontier land, to this frontier land out here in the Magic Kingdom. So there's a little uh, tip, a little trick. You can ride on the Liberty Bell over here. It's not the Mark Twain at Disney World. Around the Rivers of America, around there, Tom Sawyer Island, and astound and astonish your friends with your crazy Disney knowledge that these actually came from the original Disneyland. So, like I said, they were building country bears here. Huge success. So they wanted to build one in Disneyland. They closed down the Indian Village. You know, it was good timing anyways. They brought all the Indian Village stuff over here to decorate this park. And look at that. There are three still remaining here. Ironically, at Disneyland, then built uh, Big Thunder Mountain. It was such a hit. They wanted to put Big Thunder Mountain over here in the Magic Kingdom. They got rid of most of the totem poles, but three survived. Three little pieces of the old Indian Village. All that's left in Anaheim, and you'll know this if you saw my video about that, is what's now, well, not for long, the Briar Patch store that was under Splash Mountain, that little sod roofed, uh, like grass roofed building right there, that was the old Indian Village trading post or one of the little stores there. That's the only building surviving at Disneyland of its old school uh, Indian Village. It wasn't the ori original Indian Village that opened in 1955. That was in a whole different spot over by Pirates. That's a whole long story. That's all in the video. Um, what was I talking about? But. Anyway, the point is, this is all that remains. Other than that little log store, this is all that remains that I know of, of the Indian Village. Now, I remember there being more totem poles along the rivers of America, but here's the thing. These particular totem poles are not super 
authentic in terms of they weren't created uh, in any kind of partnership with the tribes. These are some of the ones that just sort of got chucked out there. They're sort of good enough. Uh, either designs copied out of books the best they could by Imagineers and stuff like that. Or later they had a bunch uh, when they first even built Epcot and stuff like that. And some for Magic Kingdom that were carved, um, made to order, but carved by my friend Leroy Schmaltz at Oceanic Arts, including the huge Epcot totem poles. But then later, they actually went in and replaced those totem poles, those Oceanic Arts totem poles, with ones, I mean, I'm talking about recent history, I'm talking about this century, um, replaced them with designs that were made in partnership with Native Americans and actually carved, hand carved out uh, by a Native American carver. And so much more culturally sensitive, much more, uh, some would say appropriate. Actually, honestly, if I'm gonna stand in a theme park and look at a totem pole and it's cool to have just anything and go, oh, your imagination, like it's cool to look at a fake pirate ship, right? And go, I'm imagining I'm there. I'm imagining I'm seeing a pirate ship. And so, you know, anything can captivate your imagination. You know, I, I'm imagining that's a real barrel. I'm imagining that's a real sack of flour instead of a big lump of fiberglass and concrete or whatever the heck that is. But if you tell me, no, no, this is actually a real thing and it tells this real story and it's actually authentic, that just makes it even better. So on every level, not just the cultural sensitivity level and all that kind of stuff, because yeah, there's, there's a case to be made for keeping things just because they're historically significant because they've been in a theme park a long time ago. I kind of agree with that sometimes. But yeah, if you're gonna look at a totem pole and especially since totem poles tell stories and they're very steeped and obviously deep, deep cultural traditions uh, that have never been broken, we still, understand some of that. There are still people uh, from tribes and nations who can tell us exactly what they are. And yes, by the way, you see those pipes there under the camouflage netting. Also one of my favorite uh, Disney World secrets. I love how they set all this up for everyone to stare at. It gets all your attention, takes attention away from that. Weird. Weird. Anyway, the point is, I'm glad these are still here from uh, Disneyland. It's cool that the Epcot ones were replaced. It's cool, although you can still find some Leroy Schmaltz carved ones inside the actual Canada store over there, but I'll show you that little secret in a future time. Uh, which ones are which are very hard to figure out, but if you spend enough time with Leroy, you can kind of, you can kind of go, that's a Leroy right there. Anyway, um, but yeah, there you go. This is from Disneyland. These are from the original Disneyland. It's not an unknown fact. I've heard it bandied uh, about before, but very few people actually come over here and take a picture of them. And uh, obviously, if I could find them again in the mass of pictures of the Indian Village I was looking at last night, I will post uh, side-by-sides of the ones here today, right now on the screen, with the old pictures of them at the park. Because, like I said, these two here, I have matched up in the past. I have not found an exact matching old school picture for this one. Hey, maybe I will by the time I check this one uh, on the computer and upload it for you to watch. This has been a long trip. Like I said, we filmed all those crazy suites. We've done a lot of crazy stuff on this trip. There was a whole gang of people that I had to meet up with. I met up with my friend Adam Wu. I went to this thing called Swamp Fest. The video, uh, his video is up on the Daily Wu channel instantly demonetized crazy stuff i fight uh, pretty hard to keep this channel kind of family friendly and sort of you know open to everyone and so i didn't think it would mesh well plus i don't want to get a strike in the whole thing so um a slap on the wrist as it were for all kinds of explosions and crazy things that are happening in that video but i did post my version of it on patreon it's very similar to adam's video so if you'd like to check it out and you're not a patreon member of mine you can go over the daily woo and check out swamp fest we filmed some weird secrets of history in the magic kingdom here some like goldies but goodies some little weird things some little secret things some history that most people don't talk about um some that everybody does talk about uh all kinds of crazy stuff has happened in the last couple of weeks here at the magic kingdom and i am foot sore tired like i said it's my last day i'm ready to go home ready to hug my family and uh spend a little time relaxing before going on to other non-disney related adventures some road trips and crazy things i got hopefully lined up for this year we gotta bring out new merch we haven't had a new t-shirt in a long time all kinds of stuff to do so i have errands to do i have people to see i've got <laughs> i've got a life to live at home so i'm looking forward to it you know you've been someplace long enough uh when you're in a dream landscape like the magic kingdom and you're going can't wait to get home, can't wait to eat in my own kitchen, go to my own bathroom, sleep in my own bed, all that kind of stuff. Maybe she was looking for the smoking area and got disappointed. I don't know why that lady turned around. But anyways, this was the one last day that I had to pop into Magic Kingdom. I actually got my bags packed and ready to drive away. Someone's coming for a photo pass, we better get out of the way here. I'm getting ready to 
drive away and head out of the Central Florida, Orlando area and the Magic Kingdom, Disney World bubble, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is my last day to pop in and I thought it would be appropriate since I'm going back to Disneyland, obviously, in just a few days here flying home to check out one little piece of home here in the Magic Kingdom. And I thought it was even more appropriate to point these out. Very few people pointed them out, maybe because it's a sensitive issue, cultural sensitivity. I don't know. People are, are skeptical, scared to talk about that kind of stuff these days. Um, I figured it was appropriate to point them out because you never know how long they're going to last. Like I said, the big Epcot ones, which are iconic, were replaced to, you know, more accurately reflect actual Canadian, they're in the Canada Pavilion, to more accurately reflect uh, North American uh, native tribes and First, Pe First Nations peoples and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so I figure maybe one day the same thing might happen in Magic Kingdom. Either they'll get replaced with something a little bit more accurate, uh, or, you know, could be that they just disappear entirely. Look at somebody panned out all that gold and then just left it there. We're rich. Uh, I'm so tired, you guys. I'm so tired. Or maybe they'll just disappear entirely and not be replaced. Or maybe they'll stay there forever and they'll be here 10, 20, 30, 40, or even 50 more years hence. Um, but just in case things have a habit or a, a strange way of disappearing here at the Magic Kingdom and never being seen again. Uh, for example, like John Burley, the uh, Walt Disney World version of Jim Burley, the uh, Native American cigar store statue guy over on Main Street USA. Uh, He's disappeared. I, I think he's uh, back in the central shops or whatever. I think he's back supposedly for some kind of repair. He's just a fiberglass shell. And sometimes things will disappear for years and years and then reappear. But I have a feeling one day those totem poles are going to disappear and never come back. So I thought we might as well take a look. And plus, you know, I'll take any excuse to wander around the Magic Kingdom. I'll take any excuse to get some gluten-free uh, chicken over here. They got some nice fried chicken and fries. I can't usually have any fried chicken tenders or fries or anything like that at home with the celiac disease so one last round of food one last round of walking around magic kingdom one last little disneyland easter egg here one last little magic kingdom secret one last little sometimes vlog that's already gone 10 times longer than i intended it to i wanted it to be short and sweet and simple because i gotta eat and i gotta go meet up with people pack my bags i'm actually driving south to uh someplace i have never been and i'm gonna meet you back there for one more sometimes vlog hangout before I go back home to California. Before even that happens though, look at this, Tiana. I mean, it looks ready to open. They had the flume running the other day. They were testing the boats the other day so you could actually see the logs back in the flume, which is very interesting. And uh, all of that's kind of been posted about a lot. But one thing I had managed to stay kind of spoiler free about for a while and just suddenly noticed when I went down here to go to the old Splash Mountain restroom here underneath the Frontierland uh, station. Oh, gone our Br'er Fox, Br'er Bear, and Br'er Rabbit. They're gone, but if you want to see their final day of operation, uh, we got to film a pretty epic farewell to the Magic Kingdom Splash Mountain when it was closing down last year. Man, they built this ride quickly. The animatronics look insane. They look amazing. I don't know if you saw Imagineering post those. They look incredible. But this, this I had not seen. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that was a surprise to me. I, just based on how much they've changed the front of the mountain, just based on how much they're changing the inside, I mean, they really got it almost nothing. I'm sure some of the trees and different props and stuff are gonna be the same, but just based on how much they changed the front of the mountain, I really thought they were gonna change the entrance to this a lot more, especially, I don't know if you guys have seen Maybe if you're Disney World folks, you haven't seen how they changed the restaurant over there. The French uh, Quarter restaurant, whatever the stinking restaurant is, I can't think of it right now, New Orleans Square, they made it into Tiana's Palace and they've got like big smokestacks and made the front look like a steamboat. And so I, I just, for some reason, kind of figured they would do that with the outside of the entrance to Splash Mountain, but nope, that big weird barn is still there and uh, it's just painted yellow. And it's got these weird, colorful murals on the outside. Now, I'm not sure if this is the final design. Uh, okay, come on. It's very, very strange. And I'll tell you why, because isn't uh, Princess and the Frog is kind of set back in the day, back in the old times. And uh, these modern, uh, these murals look very New Orleans. They look very like, you know, lots of stuff that I've seen in New Orleans. But they look like lots of stuff I've seen in New Orleans, like now in my lifetime, not 
what I think of as old timey sort of bayou looking stuff. But maybe we're not supposed to be in New Orleans. Maybe we're supposed to be somewhere else in the bayou. I have no idea. Well, I'll have to wait and see. Anyway, just not what I was expecting to see um, just the Splash Mountain entrance painted yellow with, uh, with some, I mean, the murals are fine, but it just, it looks like the kind of thing that's on the side of a daycare or, um, what am I trying to, what am I thinking of? The daycare or an elementary school or something like that. Like that style of mural, like come to Tiana's daycare center. That's kind of what it reminds me of. So I'm just surprised it's not as epic as the actual transformation to the front of the mountain. I'll show you really quick and then say goodbye. I mean, this part of the ride is so colorful and creatively transformed that I just naturally assumed that's how the other part of the ride was going to be as well. Of course it isn't, uh, but you know, you never know. They still have time. This is supposed to open in the summer, but it may open even earlier. It may open towards, you know, late spring or even before summer vacation begins because you never know with Disney. Sometimes they tend to soft open things way before you expect them to open and to appear. Sometimes they do cast member tests and then they don't actually open the ride for months and months after that. And you're thinking it's going to open any day and it doesn't and it doesn't. So we have yet to hear about an official opening date, uh, but I've heard the target was always June, July or August. Um, but you know, you never know. It could be May, could be April, could be the week after I leave Florida for all I know. It'll be interesting to see how it turns out. I have a totally open mind about it. Uh, Princess and the Frog. It's a fine Disney movie, just like all the other fine Disney movies they based attractions on here. So I can't wait to see what's going on, where the adventure takes you. And I kind of can't wait to splash down right there with that beautiful view of the Magic Kingdom and through here. Of course, I'm nostalgic for um, Splash Mountain. I grew up with it. It was one of the first new rides at Disneyland uh, when they built it there that I ever experienced. And I love riding it here because obviously it gets hot and muggy. Even at night here, you get all hot and sweaty. So it was just always fun to splash down here, especially when it's cold in the winter or, you know, cold for Florida and um, splash down here and with no line at night and all that kind of stuff. So I grew very, very fond of Splash Mountain, which is why I did my final farewell to it. So I made my peace with it. I'm not one of the, one of the grumpy people though. You know, I, I would keep everything the way I grew up with it forever, like a museum if I could. You know, every ride and attraction would never change, but that, that wouldn't work, would it? People would go, what's this old, weird, crusty park? That wouldn't be any good. It'd be like a grandma's house uh, more than an exciting, and compelling thing. It's gotta stay old. You have to have that vintage feel with Disney, especially Disneyland in California. I think that's what they're heimbucking right now. They're making it feel too new. Even the curbs and everything, you're taking away little bits and little bits of Walt's Park. So you want that vintage feeling when you go to Disneyland. You wanna be part of the vintage magic and the old Walt Disney magic and all that kind of stuff. Same thing with Magic Kingdom here. You want that 50 years of history and all that kind of stuff. But you also want it to be dynamic and new and tell you new stories and keep you engaged and keep you excited. So. You know, it's just like a menu. You want the old favorites on there, but you also want to try some new dishes every once in a while, or you're going to go to a new restaurant. So I kind of get it. I'm excited to see how it turns out. Um, this is all different and completely changed, but hey, we got those poles over there. A little piece of old Disneyland history. Ironically, we don't know when Country Bears is going to reopen either. That's also changed. I told you I thought it was going to change years ago. That was, but that's been coming for years, and I'm glad they didn't just rip it out wholesale and replace it with completely different things. It's still going to be bears. They're still going to sing. That is cool. Hey, Carousel of Progress is still here. Maybe if I have time, I'll run over and check that out. But right now, I've got a date with Destiny, food, and then I've got to get the heck out of here. Thanks for hanging out with me. Just a little hangout in the Magic Kingdom. Uh, if you're wondering why this video isn't like other videos, those are the Random Land videos. The logo looks like this. Oh, that's how you know it's a Random Land video, more of a documentary style thing. And this is a sometimes, sometimes vlog video. The logo looks like this. And that's how you know it's more of a walk and talk, usually more of an unedited kind of walk around thing. It's just you and me, we're hanging out. For now, we've all done our duty. Check the links down below if you haven't already. Subscribe if you enjoyed this. Uh, give me a big thumbs up if you hated it. Show me who's boss. See you later. Go home, sleep well.